four, three, two, one. Right now. Five, four, three, two, one. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you for coming back. For those of you who came back, for those of you who are just coming for the first time, uh, thank you for that, too. I really appreciate your time. We'll try to use it efficiently and make sure you're, you're really happy that you spent the time here. Um, all right. Mission possible. Large classes, huge potentials. So once again, I, I, I love large classes. I love teaching large classes. Uh, to give you a sense, I teach the introductory psychology class here at University of Toronto, and it's 1,700 students uh, and me. And in fact, a lot of these things you're going to learn about are things that I've adopted and you know tried to use to make my class more engaging and, and to work on skill development uh, as well. And, and now luckily we've uh, built out Peer Scholar which allows this to be shared. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, it's part of a three-part series. Uh, the first webinar we already had was focused on writing and how you can bring writing back to large classes. Uh, if you missed that, we have it recorded and we will probably send out the recording of that first one along with our follow-up to this one. Um, today, we're really going to focus on, we say presentations and demonstrations, you know, really anything of that sort where we want students to kind of take the lead and demonstrate some sort of skill to us. Um, and so it could be anything from uh, a medical context, for example, where, where nurses who are being trained might be demonstrating how to do sutures or something like that, um, you know, right across the board to typical oral presentations, for example. Uh, and so we will show you that not only can you do this in your large class, um, but in fact, you can do it in a way that's extremely powerful educationally. Um, and really rewarding for the instructor. Um, you know, something that's fun and different, not a lot of work and a whole lot of kind of good feeling that comes out of it. Um, once we finish today, we will have another webinar on Thursday uh, that's going to focus on giving students experience both giving and learning from feedback, which is a critical life skill. Uh, it's sort of part of every peer scholar activity, but we're really gonna zoom in on it and show you how to kind of make the most out of that part of things. Today though, of course, it's about presentations and demonstrations, or I might say more generally, skills. Um, we, we teach knowledge to our students, so we, we tell them about you know, the facts of our disciplines and all those sorts of things, um, but we also want them to learn various skills. And, and I think we teach knowledge very well, but we find skill, skills harder to teach. You know, knowledge, we have our traditional kind of approaches. We give good lectures, hopefully. We have great textbooks. They can convey, convey knowledge well. And, and you can simply learn something just by being exposed to it in that kind of way as a student. But skills are different. Skills you learn by doing them and by watching other people do them, preferably in a structured environment where you're getting a lot of feedback. Um, that's the context that skills are developed. Now, this is a challenge, of course, when we get to very large classes. So we often think about, you know, our small seminar classes. We'll have students give demonstrations or presentations. But how do we do that in a large class? Just how do we manage, you know, all of the, the information we need? And, and just logistically, how can we make it happen? And, and for many of us, we can't come up with a good answer to that. Uh, and the result is that many large classes become focused on knowledge um, they become sort of characterized by lectures, textbooks, and multiple choice exams. Assessing knowledge is boring, okay? If you're a student, if you remember this sort of situation of going through a multiple choice test, you know, it's, it's not very interesting, it's not very exciting, and in my opinion, if your class has become one of these, um, where it's predominantly multiple choice and lectures, then the more important thing is there's a real wasted opportunity here, especially if you start to think about assessment contexts as situations where learning can happen, where we can mix assessment 
with learning and we can create a much more engaging version of learning and in fact can come up with something that's much more skills focused. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how we can do that. Now I do have to draw on Peer Scholar. Um, for those of you who were in the first webinar um, saw you know, a, a pretty good idea of what Peer Scholar is and how it works. I'm not going to go back all over that today, but I do want to just, especially for the new people here today, um, hit the, the, the basic process. Uh, and I will show you uh, a couple of examples embedded in Peer Scholar, so you will get to see the technology as well. But for now, here's the process. Three steps. Step one, students are just asked to compose something. Um, in the previous webinar, we talked about them composing written pieces, and that's certainly possible and one powerful use case. But because Peer Scholar is a digital platform, uh, it can take any form of digital composition. Um, so we could have music files, we could have pictures, we could have videos, uh, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today, of how that capability really allows us to, to up our game and have fun doing it. But for now, step one, students submit something. Step two, they engage in peer assessment. So in this phase, they log in and they will now see a randomly selected and anonymously presented subset of their peers' compositions. I'm going to just use the number five to make things easy as I talk about stuff. So imagine they see five of their peer compositions and they are now asked to basically act as the teacher, rate these compositions, assess them, provide constructive feedback, as you'll see, the instructor really has a lot of control over the analysis students do. The bigger point is they are being pushed to, to watch other people demonstrate whatever it was they had to demonstrate, and they are being asked to analyze that in a very deep way and to provide constructive feedback to their peers as they do. While they're doing this to their peers, their peers are also doing it to their submission. So in the third step, it's all about receiving feedback and learning from it. So we call this the reflect phase. Students see the feedback that their peers have attached to their work uh, and they assess it. Um, and that forces them to really think about it deeply and analyze it deeply. And in fact, if you wish, you can take the next step and actually uh, allow them to submit a revised version of their work, um, a formative revision that's been guided by the feedback. Okay, so they submit something, they assess their peers, and then they respond to the feedback they've received. This is all handled in the online platform, so it deals with all the logistics of sharing this information and such. You don't have to. As, a, as an instructor, you just basically set up the process. Peer Scholar does the rest, uh, and you'll have a sense of that. Okay, so one of the things I want to highlight today as we talk about skills and how we can use this Peer Scholar uh, educational process to develop skills uh, is this, comp this, this connection between video and skills. Uh, video, well, let me just return to what I said earlier. We learn skills by doing and watching others doing. Video provides us a way of recording us doing something. Um, and when we look at the videos of other people, now we can watch them doing something. So video provides a very powerful medium for skill development. Um, so when we use these video-based activities in the context of, of peer assessment, then we really get both sides of that coin where students are being asked to produce the behavior, but then they're also being asked to examine that behavior as others produce it. What I sometimes call ear training of a sort, uh, what musicians would call ear training. Very powerful learning context, as you'll see. Okay, so if we think about video for a little bit, it's got a couple of other aspects that are really powerful educationally. For students, it's relevant. You know, think of their social media use. Um, a lot of what students share are images and especially videos, and that's what they react to. They're very used to shooting videos with their cell phone, seeing the videos that other people have shot and reacting to that. So it's very much in their world. They understand the relevance of a good video. Um, video also sort of naturally encourages a student to be creative, and it also encourages critical thinking. Um, let's, let's touch that last point, this, the revisionist mindset. When I've done uh, projects that ask students to submit videos, one of the things we asked them once was, how many videos did you shoot before you actually submitted one? And the numbers tend to be in the, in the range of three to seven or eight, sometimes even more. So if you kind of think about this, students are already shooting a video, looking at it, 
analyzing it, thinking of how it could be better, revising it, so shooting it again, et cetera. And so they're going through a whole lot of deep learning before they even submit their video, right? So video's got a whole lot of mojo, I would like to say. Um, and it really kind of also makes an activity for the students fun. So they find this fun, they find it interesting, they find it social. So this activity they're doing in your class is something they like, um, which is really cool for you too. Uh, you know, I can guarantee you that when you see your students really enjoying an, an activity you've created, there's mojo in that too. It feels really good, kind of feeds the soul. Uh, and so this is the kind of thing you can do with Peer Scholar. Okay. I want to just give you some examples to make all this concrete because it's really nice. Um, now there's all sorts of skills we could focus on, for examples. Uh, again, I talked about writing skills in the first webinar and obviously that's very important to all of us. Um, but in the medical realm, there's all sorts of skills that doctors and nurses and, and everybody associated with the medical profession has to learn. So one of the things they could do is actually engage in that skill and then peer assess other people uh, engaging that skill. Oral presentations, important. Things like using tools in various contexts. What tool do you use and, and how do you use it well? We're talking about tools, what about musical tools, musical instruments? Um, you're gonna see an example of how Peer Scholar is currently being used to teach guitar. Dancing, etc. Here's another example. Let's say you want students to understand how an EEG system works. Well, if, you could, if they could book time in an EEG lab and shoot little videos of them hooking up their friends, uh, you could now have them peer assessing videos of how to properly hook up an EEG system. So they could get, you know, in a sense, a really powerful experience that way. So these are all the kinds of skills we want to talk about. Um, and let me just give you an example of a couple of those. And we'll focus on these two, actually, giving oral presentations and playing a musical instrument for now. Uh, but you'll see that this will, you know, generalize to all sorts of other situations, too. So... I believe, well, we'll put this up just for context. Here's the two we're gonna focus on. Oral presentation, this is based on things I do in my 1700 student introductory psychology class, works well. Um, and finger style guitar, I'm going to be borrowing from uh, a colleague of mine, Professor uh, Pat Feely from uh, Western, uh, Western University in Ontario. Uh, he teaches finger style guitar, classical guitar, and he uses Peer Scholar to do that in a really kind of powerful way. So I want to give you a sense of what he does as well. So let's leave this slideshow for a second and let me go into Peer Scholar itself. Here I am logging in. Right now I'm logging into the standalone version. It integrates with learning management systems and such as well, easily. I've got a couple of um, demos here, so I'm just gonna go into the oral presentation. So let me just, um, you know, we only have limited time today, so I'm just giving you a taste here. What we're dipping into is the assess phase. So students have already submitted a video, and now we're acting as though we are a student going in to assess the work of our peers. Um, when we come in, we would initially see the instructions that are there, and if there's a rubric that's involved, and in this case, there was. Uh, so in this case, there is an uh, oral presentation rubric that students were given before they even did their own work. They were told, this is how you're going to be scored. These are the things we want you working on when you give your presentation. Uh, and then ultimately, we're gonna score each other based on this rubric. Um, and so students know that ahead of time, it can guide them as they do things. And now when they come in to the peer assessment phase, they are now going to see the videos presented by their peers. In this case, we have three of their peers. They can watch the video directly within Peer Scholar, so it's all embedded here. Um, I, I won't... Um... Our third finalist is Emily Johnston from the School of Pharmacy. Okay, so obviously we've just grabbed videos off of YouTube because we want to protect everyone's privacy as we should. Um, but in this case, the student would watch the video. And then what I've done over here is mimic that rubric. Okay, so let's look at the rubric again just for a second. Notice it had three um, sort of sub components, the nonverbal skills, the verbal skills, and the content. And so what I've done here is nonverbal, verbal content. So I very easily matched to that rubric. So now a student could go through and simply um, fill in values that they think are right. I've also allowed them provide, to provide a constructive comment here on each of these sub parts of, of oral presentation. So they can, you know, tell the student one thing in that area they could do to improve. 
Okay, so let me just highlight again, the really powerful aspect of this is that first of all, they're learning two ways, by giving themselves, but also by watching others, some of whom are better than they are, some of whom not as, as good perhaps. Both cases give them useful information of how they can improve. And you can also, after they go through these three videos of different uh, presenters, they can also go look at their own video. And there's my own video back there. Um, and so you can ask them to self-assess explicitly. In this case, I've changed the question. You can have them do the same question. In this case, I said, what did you learn by assessing the work of your peers? List anything you saw that you would like to keep in mind as you prepare your final presentation. So this is to encourage reflection, metacognitive awareness, this kind of thing, which, which is really you know, made powerful in this step. So a very simple ex example, but notice how they can be thinking about oral presentations, learning a lot about oral presentations, and the really cool thing from a big class perspective is they're doing this without having to be live in front of somebody else. They're learning the, the foundational skills of presenting, getting comfortable with those, and then as they move on to the smaller classes, now they can try to, to employ those skills in front of a live audience, which is a whole other level, right? To, to deal with that social pressure. Uh, and so it's a great way to scaffold skill development by, you know, right away in the, in the very first classes, starting to have them work on it. Um, let me just give you that other example, um, just to show you a couple things, play that funky music. So this is based on the kind of approach that Pat Feely uses at Western University. Um, so I'll pop in there. Same idea here. Notice that in this case, I've got them seeing five peers work and they're not seeing their own. Uh, you can configure this as you like, and I'll very quickly show you how easy that is to do in just a moment. Um, but once again, you know, they go to peer one. And what I've done here is I've got a different assessment. So in this case, it's not a straightforward rubric. Now I should say Pat does use a rubric. In fact, Pat has developed an 18 point guitar playing rubric, 18 things students can zone in on. Very, very powerful learning uh, for them. Um, I, I, I chose not to replicate that here. I wanted to show you some of the other things you could do, but you can ask them all sorts of questions. So what grade would you give this if you'd like? Um, which of the following things did the student do well? So you can have a checklist kind of thing. They did those things well. Uh, if you were going to give this person advice about one thing they could focus on to be better, what advice would you give them? If this video were on social media, how many stars would you give it? Um, how does the student's playing compare with yours, better or worse? This is to really, again, focus that metacognitive thing, getting people thinking about their own playing relative to the student. The bigger point being, this side of the interface is your assessment form, and you can really use that to guide the way the students interact with the videos and learn from the videos as they go through, okay? Um, and notice, by the way, another distinction here. One of the nice things with the, with the pad approach is you really don't have to see someone's head when they play guitar. Um, seeing their torso is perfectly fine. You wanna see their hands. So in this case, we can use video and we can also um, preserve anonymity. Uh, which is really nice when you can do that. With the oral presentations, that's a little bit more of a challenge, okay? So very quickly, I'm just gonna flip over here and log in now as the instructor that produced those activities. And let's go into this um, music one that I just did. And I, I wanna show you literally, you know, what you have to do to set this up, which is, which is mostly think. <laughs> the actual work isn't much. It's coming up with a really cool activity. So basically you provide instructions for phase one and if you want to attach, um, actually, yeah, if you want to attach rubrics or, or uh, embed video or anything, you can do that. This is where the instructor set up that assessment form on the right. Uh, and so there's a whole toolbox of things you can use to set up an assessment. So they did that just by adding a few of these. Um, and that's essentially it. Um, so it's really a question of coming up with a cool thing for the students to do uh, and something they'll really like and enjoy and find engaging. Uh, and it's very little time and effort required on the part of the instructor uh, to get this working. All right, cool. So let's just um, you know, follow up from that simply by saying, uh, giving you some examples. These are five examples. There's, there's many more, but these are five quite different examples of, of ways that peer scholars are being used uh, in large classes 
to build skill learning. Uh, so there's the University Health Network, actually. Um, so there's people from Toronto, from University of Toronto, and from all over the, the hospitals in Toronto. They're using it in their nurse training by having nurses um, demonstrate skills by video and giving each other feedback. Sometimes, by the way, they intentionally have somebody make a number of mistakes when they do something. And the task for students is spot the mistakes. That's kind of a fun one for students to do. It gives you a sense of the opportunities. I mentioned Pat's example of fingerstyle guitar. I think Pat is with us here today virtually. Um, so if he wants to chime in or if you want to qu ask a question for Pat, please feel free. Uh, at York University, engineering students are using it for oral presentations and for group work. Peer Scholar supports group work specifically if you want students to work in groups as they peer assess and, and deal with feedback. At Humber, they're sharing and peer assessing architectural designs. So it's not videos they're using, it's images, architectural designs that are being passed back and forth. Uh, and at Rotman, they're using it for case studies. We have a very interesting case study model that, that makes for a very powerful case study experience. That would be a whole other video in, and it may be, <laughs> it may be. All right, so the bigger points from all this is, yes, you have a large class, and yes, you have huge potential. You can develop your skills with this deep and powerful learning process. You can engage your students and give them, you know, real fun mind grabbing activities. And you can also give yourself something a little bit more fulfilling than writing a multiple choice exam. You can come up with the kind of assignment that your students are talking about after class. And again, when you see them light up because they're really engaged in the learning, that feels really, really good. Uh, Critically, you can do all of the above without requiring a significant time investment on your part, and the time you do invest will be fun and rewarding. Um, so it's something that can easily scale within institutions because once instructors use it, they love it. Okay, thank you. These 20 minute ones, man, they, you got a hoof on these suckers. Um, but yeah, um, this, is, this is us, we're here. If you have a, a large summer class and you, you're intrigued and would like to use Peer Scholar, please reach out. We will help you get all set up, everything you need, we're, we're here to help with. Um, if there's you know, interest at, at any level, even into the fall, we would love to start a conversation with you. Please reach out, info at peerscholar.com. Um, if you think it's something your institution would be interested in, of course, we'd love to talk about that. Uh, as well. But um, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm just going to shut up now. I'm just going to say thank you very much for your time. I hope that was uh, useful to you. And now let's have a, let's have a QA. and a Let me know any questions you have. I saw something pop up here earlier. Um, let me see if I can make it pop up again. Um, it's perhaps already answered. No, open questions. Okay, so anybody have any questions? Any thoughts? Any reactions? Again, Pat is here. Um, So I, yeah, I, I, I want to kind of react to the one question that was posted to uh, the voiceover. So this is, I will say, a very interesting aspect of oral presentations where students do not necessarily enjoy being on video, um, which poses a dilemma. Does that mean we shouldn't ever ask them to do it, even though we know these skills are really critical? You know, I agree that's something that you have to wrestle with. I've been comfortable telling students, come on. Do it. It's, it's an academic presentation. Do your best job. Present yourself. This, this, is, this is good and important experience for you. Um, but yeah, you can choose to react to that in, in a variety of ways. Sarah, do you know anyone using this in large first-year biology classes? Well, um, we, we could certainly probably connect you with somebody who is. So right now it's being used at 60 institutions. Over, over 200,000 students uh, went through various activities uh, last year. And I am sure, I am certain that some of those involve large biology classes. Um, I'm, I'm trying to bring one to mind right off the top of my head and I cannot, but um, I'm sure that they uh, exist. And if you would like, Sarah, reach out and we will find out who's doing that and happily connect you with them and, and let you chat. That would be great. Have you ever worked with children? How do you avoid conflict of interest with children fi filming themselves? How do you keep safe? Um, so children are not, of course, um, anytime at, oh, oh, this is E minor, Emily May. I just, I just recognized your, your name. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Uh, any, 
<laughs> How are you doing? Uh, anytime uh, you're dealing with anybody in a university perspective, you certainly have to worry about privacy. So within a university context, and I know yours is a little different, but within a university context, we almost all have institutional servers. And the recommendation would be that you have them upload their video to an institutional server and then only other students, only people who can log into the institutional LMS um, could get access to it. I know your context is a little different, but it could be set up in very much the same way so that rather than having them post their videos on YouTube, um, it could be set up on, on a server you have control over uh, and that you can control who can access. Uh, and so absolutely when you're working with children, especially, but it's a good principle for anybody that that would be an important step. Absolutely. Any cases of using the video recording to authentically assess competency based education. Wow. Excellent. Um, I have a whole other webinar I need to send you, uh, Tim, but, but there's absolutely no reason. So I'll give you a taste of it here. If you have, if every student is assessed by a number of peers, um, and especially if that number is five or more, and that's, that comes from research. I can tell you more about that if you want. And if you have them applying some tool like a rubric that's valid for the competency you're interested in, then you will end up with a measure for every student of where they are on that competency. Uh, so if it's oral presentation, you know, if we applied that rubric, you could ultimately come up on, with a score based on peer averages. And absolutely, that could provide, you know, at, at the very least an assessment, you know, maybe even a harder core sort of summative um, uh, value for their skill. So that's one claim is that you could use peer assessment in this way to absolutely not only develop these skills, but also measure them. So I'd love to talk to you more about that, Tim. Um, can you show us how the interface looks? Um, uh, so yes, and does it come in an app? And how do people use it? Uh, so it, it tends to be a, a, a few different versions. So there's the standalone one and I can kind of, um, I'm not going to see your questions when I do this, but I'll, come on, let me leave please. Um, okay. So I believe you're saying, that how does the interface look to the students? Um, here, here's the, the best thing I would maybe say. Um, uh, am I even up there? Oh, come on, please. Sorry, things are, if you do student experience, pure scholar, this is perhaps the, the, the long answer to your question. If I could type right, it would be so much better. Um, especially if you did this in YouTube, but, um, YouTube, you will see a video of me walking you right through all aspects of the student experience. Um, <sighs> it, it's there. I'll find it. We'll 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 send it out um, with the um, uh, we'll send it out with the follow up for this. But you know, essentially, you are getting a, a sense of the interface here. Um, it changes a little bit. Okay, actually, I can do this too. Sure. Um, so in the, in the create interface, it looks pretty straightforward. They just submit what they need to submit and you have some options for adding to that. Um, I'm going to do this really quick, but just to give you the overview in the assess world, you've already seen that a little bit. This is a writing example, but they have their writing examples here. They can flip through from peer to peer and they have their assessment that they perform to the right. Um, in the third and final phase, when they log in, they now see, their work on the right and this this might be their video and they're seeing the assessments that peers have given so they can again cycle through the assessments and this is where they're actually asked to rate the feedback so you can get them to be very analytical about the feedback people are giving them to teach them how to learn from feedback so you know in a nutshell that's that's i think a sense of the ui um, so hopefully that's helpful very happy to do a full-scale demo uh, with anybody who's interested in, in that, no problem at all. Now, if I can find, if I can find you guys back, uh, here we are. Uh, gracias, thank you. Please share, Steve. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely, we'll do. Would kids do this on their own, or would parents do it with them? How do I kidify this? Yeah, that, that's a really kind of cool question uh, for us. We we would love to think about that with you. We we did we did have this. Well, we certainly have this notion that that students at a very young age are are cognitively capable of of dealing with all this kind of stuff. And so, it would be really a question of the interface. 
um, and, and just trying to make sure the interface was comfortable for them. Now it is, I mean, one of the nice things I can say is, is um, Dwayne Paré, my, my sort of um, partner in all of everything to do with Peer Scholar, um, he spends a lot of time looking at the latest interface designs and stuff, which children do as well. Uh, and, and the goal is to make Peer Scholar really fit what students are used to seeing. So my suspicion is that the children may have a much easier time navigating the interface than the parents might, uh, depending on how young they are. Um, but certainly it would be cool to, to think about that more. Um, do the teachers have the ability to extract the data to make a conclusion long term over 20 feet? Yeah, so we, we, when we get into more of what we call an institutional application, we have an, an administrator dashboard where that's the exact idea of the administrator dashboard. It allows you to pull data out of Peer Scholar and look at trends of various sorts, various learning analytics. Um, and so this kind of thing that you're suggesting right now uh, is, is certainly doable. Uh, we're building out, we're really kind of complexifying, if that's a word, that admin dash right now. And so by fall, it's going to be um, a fully featured, really powerful little beast. We look forward to unveiling that. Uh, but absolutely, that's, um, that's a big part of things too, I think, is the ability to, um, at least at an administrative level, if you have a lot of people using it, to be able to see what's going on and to try to make sure um, everything's working the way you want and, and to interject when it isn't. So, yeah, cool, cool. <laughs> Any other questions, thoughts, discussion? Would you be a rock star success student for online piano lessons? Um, I can't play piano. <laughs> I could be a rock star success student for guitar, although I'm not that good either in guitar. But but uh, yeah, hey. Um, but by the way, some of you in the, in the background, uh, I did have a, a bit of a discussion with uh, Emily May before all of this. Uh, and, and she's imagining, which is really cool for uh, an online music course for students taking piano or guitar lessons, uh, so that in addition to interacting with the material, they'll be able to solidify what they're learning by putting it into practice. Uh, uh, if you notice, her, her name is suspiciously similar to that Pat Feely guy I talked about at Western University. Um, Emily is Pat's daughter, um, music runs in their family. But yeah, I mean, that's, I think, a really great example of, of how you can use this to complement the knowledge, you know, teach them the knowledge, but then ask them to actually use it. Uh, and we all know that that's a very, very powerful way to, to make the knowledge stick while also developing the skills. So yeah, fantastic. Cool, cool. Rockstar, huh? I'll just stick with that one. <laughs> Any other questions from anybody else? Um, we've got time. We, we promised 30 minutes, so um, don't stop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> little journey stuck in there, huh? Um, if, if there are no other questions, we will cut it there, but we thank you again all very much for your time. Um, really appreciate it. And please, please feel comfortable reaching out to us uh, for any way we can help you to kind of get rolling with what you're doing. Cool. Excellent. You're welcome. E minor. <laughs> <laughs>